So first, let me start with uh, giving an update on uh, what's going on on our campus right now. I'm sure everybody's interested in, in COVID and the testing and uh, some numbers. Um, as of Monday, July the 6th, we had over 300 student athletes that were back on campus uh, representing uh, all of our 19 mm. schools in some way, shape, or form. Um, when I last met with each of you, I shared with you what I called our confidence plan for our student athletes to return uh, back on June the 8th, starting with the football and our fall sports. Uh, that, that plan included our testing protocols, our facility cleaning, uh, how we're gonna staff those facilities, et cetera. What I can tell you is I truly believe that plan has worked very, very well. I'm extremely proud of our medical staff, our student athletes, our support staff, that includes our, our athletic trainers, our strength conditioning coaches, and, and each of our head coaches for really setting the tone. Um, and again, for our student athletes for doing an incredible job uh, making an adjustment as they return to campus. And uh, to give you a little feel to date, we've had less than 10 student athletes and two staff members who have tested positive for COVID with all but one of those that were infected having returned to their workouts and or work at this time. So again, less than 10 student athletes, two staff members, uh, but only one active case uh, right now. So meaning that all those that had tested positive uh, have returned either to their voluntary workouts or to their work environment. Um, and based on the contact tracing from those positive tests, uh, we currently have about 20 student athletes who are still in some phase of their 14 day quarantine period, uh, but each of those student athletes has tested negative. Um, so as we look forward to our fall sports, football, volleyball, soccer, and cross country uh, officially beginning practice during the first week of August, our testing protocols will be enhanced and, and that will include at that point in time some rapid response testing on a weekly basis for all participating student athletes in those fall sports. And uh, you may have seen about uh, an hour or so ago that the NCAA released kind of their third version of their medical guidelines and recommendations that, that included uh, testing prior to at least 72 hours prior to competition. And we're prepared uh, both as an institution and as a conference uh, to fall in line with those plans. And so, so that's the COVID kind of update. And I'll get through a few of these updates and then open it up for questions. Uh, so the outlook on football to date, I think you're all aware that on Monday, the SEC ADs met in Birmingham to discuss a number of issues with an obvious focus on the upcoming football season. And, and what I can tell you, and I think probably what you've heard this week is that we're gonna to continue to be patient as a conference before making any decisions. Um, there's several options that are on the table right now. The first option uh, still being the 12 game schedule that for us starts on November 5th versus Nevada, followed by a road game on September 12th at Notre Dame. Um, we can't move on to the second option until we eliminate the first option. And that first option is still very much on the table as are another uh, other options. Uh, the impact of the Pac-12 and Big Ten decisions have been minimal. Uh, really only two games, Colorado at Texas A&M and Alabama and USC down in Dallas. So those, those decisions by those other Power Five conferences, uh, were the, those are the only two games we lost. And so as we sit here today, um, what I believe from my conversations with Commissioner Sankey that the SEC, the Big 12 and the ACC are, are on the same page as far as our collective desire to be patient before making any decisions. When you look at some of the in-state rivalries that exist, especially between the SEC and the ACC, it seems to make sense that Clemson should play South Carolina and Georgia should play Georgia Tech and Florida should play Florida State. Um, and so just eliminating those games because you wanna play a conference only schedule, at least at this point, does not make a great deal of sense. Uh, football games at Razorback Stadium, our, our event operations and external team and consultation with the Arkansas Department of Health are, are finalizing a plan for football games at Razorback Stadium as well as soccer and volleyball games this fall. Uh, we're working toward a goal to be able to accommodate each of our close to 32,700 season ticket holders who, who make a choice to attend the games or to continue with their season tickets along with our students and player families. Um, again, attending games this year is going to involve several changes. The first uh, being mobile ticketing. Uh, there will most likely be some staggered entry times for fans, assigned entry gates. They'll, I think you will see defined directional movement of patrons on concourses and aisles, meaning 
Um, when you're on the concourse, you'll go down one way and come back the other, and there'll be very overlap, very very little overlapping of traffic. And then we're working with Levy, our concession partner, to develop uh, pre-packaged concession items, as well as potentially pre-ordered and prepaid concession items. Uh, the field's going to look different. Um, the team box is now going to go from the 15-yard line to the 15-yard line. Uh, there'll be limited non-essential personnel on the sidelines, uh, limited members of the media on the sidelines. Um, there'll be no on-field presentations or recognitions, um, and still yet to be determined if, if we'll have um, any performances by band or cheerleaders um, on the field. So some of the things that really make SEC football games and college football special, the, the pageantry that we're all used to, probably not going to exist um, in a college football venue this year. Uh, financially, uh, football is incredibly important to us at the University of Arkansas. And I think uh, my fellow SEC members would say the same thing. For us, it generates about 70 million of our approximately $124 million budget. Uh, not to mention the economic impact that Razorback football has across Northwest Arkansas and across our state. Um, so obviously, if we're not able to play football, um, there are going to be some very challenging financial decisions as a director of athletics that I'm going to have to make. Um, what I will tell you that the, the safety, the health, and well-being of our student athletes will always be first and foremost, and we will never co compromise that. But if we can find a way to safely play football, soccer, volleyball, and cross country this fall, that is our number one goal. So I will stop right there and um, we'll open it up. Bob, you got a question already? That's it, right, Bob. Hey, we'll can you hear thing. me okay? Yeah, we'll do the same thing, everybody. Okay. We'll do two questions and then rotate so we can try to get through everybody, okay? Um, Hunter, uh, Governor Hutchinson announced today that he was gonna have, a, I guess, a statewide mask a mandate I was wondering your reaction to that. And then the second part of that is the Georgia governor. I, I can't remember his name, but, but he's basically repealing all the local uh, mandates in his state about masks. Just wondering what your, your feelings are about those decisions. Well, I fully support the governor. I fully support my good friend, Doug McMillan, and, and the staff at Walmart for the decision that they made. I fully support the Board of Trustees for our system and the decision that they made. Um, it's a shame, in my opinion, that wearing a mask has to become a political decision. Uh, to me, it's just the right thing to do uh, based on what we've heard from medical personnel. And uh, me and my family, uh, we are active mask wearers, as, uh, as are all of our staff members that have come to work. And I, I think it's the right thing to do, not only for yourself, uh, but for everyone you come in contact with. And, and then a second question. Um, you sound optimistic about being able to compete in the various sports this fall. What, 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 what's your level of optimism, would you say? I'd say it's mediocre, Bob, to be honest and very transparent. Mediocre. It's not as high as it was a month ago. I mean, obviously, what has uh, trended across our country with this virus over the past uh, four to six weeks is not at all what we had expected, at least not what I had expected. I thought as we sat in May and we made a decision to bring our student athletes back on June the 8th that we had I would have said back then we had a much better opportunity for this to happen. But, you know, things can change quickly. Uh, they change quickly in the wrong direction for us. And I think if everybody will do their part um, as far as wearing the mask and social distancing, that we still have a great chance uh, to have fall sports this year because this is a virus that uh, there's been um, peaks and valleys of this thing since it started. And we've learned a great deal. I think as we look back at uh, March when this all started, uh, we made a, a quick and hasty decision, in my opinion, um, as a nation to cancel uh, at least spring sports. I think as we look back now, there's probably was a way for us to get in and modify baseball and softball and tennis and golf seasons with the, the social distancing that actually exists in some of those sports. And so I think it's just this is something we just got to be patient with, Bob. Okay, th thanks, Senator. Uh, Nate? There we go. Hunter, just as far as, as the sports you were talking about giving up, or not, or, or just about the changes you, you know, foreseeing the future, if, if football isn't played, just anything in particular you're looking at at, at this point? Yeah. 
Well, Nate, we have certain fixed expenses. Uh, one of those is a scholarship we provide for our student athletes. It's approximately $11 million. Uh, we will continue to provide those. Uh, we have some debt service on the incredible facilities that we have built. Uh, it's approximately $16 million. Uh, we may be able to refinance some of that debt to, to lower those payments and make some interest only payments. Uh, the other fixed expense we have um, is salaries. About $41 million of our budget is made up of coaches, administrators, and support staff salaries. So I think um, there'll be a time where we're going to have, to, if we don't have football, that we'll have to start looking at cutting into that pie. That's all I got for now. Thanks, Nate. Uh, Trey Beatty. Hey, Hunter. This may be a little bit hypothetical, I guess, but uh, what what would it take for all of this to stop, for the progress moving forward, uh, for everything to get canceled, I guess? Trey, I think we live in the hypothetical right now, so you ask yeah. him hypothetical question. I feel like I'm, I've been trying to answer hypothetical questions, and I don't have a great answer for that, Trey. Um, I mean, obviously, we have some states within our conference um, that are struggling as Texas and Florida, and, and, and so we need some things to get, get better in, in those states in particular uh, to help with that, but uh, I mean, we need everybody to do their part, and we need this to start trending in the other direction. Um, I think if you see this, that it does not trend in the other direction and we see a, a continued increase in cases across our country and across this region and the death rate increases, I think that will give us a pretty good indication that we're going to have to put a stop on to this. I know the last update that we got was there had been no discussion about possibly pushing the season off into the spring. Has that been mentioned at all as a contingency plan since then? I would tell you that absolutely it's, it is on the list, but I will tell you it's the last option on the list because I think you really, as we talked, like September has, 5th has to be the first option and then pushing it back a week or two and then another week or two and then maybe another week or two before you get to the spring option. I think we've got several options within the fall, uh, but we just need a, a different trend in this virus right now. Thanks, Arne. Kara? Hey, Tara. Hi, Hunter. Uh, well, first off, the, the news today coming out from A&M about them possibly wanting to move the, the game that's typically at Jerry World to College Station. Ross Bjork said that he, he talked to you about it a little bit. I was wondering what that discussion was like. Sure. Well, that's their home game this year. They've already lost a home game uh, versus Colorado. So, you know, I think Ross has a desire uh, to look at moving that game uh, to College Station. So, um, I, I listened. Obviously, we have a relationship with the Jones family here. Um, they're very supportive of that game. They own that, that venue. So um, his feelings on that may be slightly different than mine. But um, we'll, we'll see how the schedule plays out. But if that game is moved to College Station, I think it would only be fair that we get that return game here in Fayetteville next year and then potentially resume in Dallas for the final two years of that contract. I wouldn't want to see Texas A&M get a home game this year and for us not to get that return game next year. And then I was wondering if at the meeting you guys discussed what testing would look like during a football season, because I assume the SEC would have some some set protocols in place. Uh, we would. I think you'll see uh, some PCR testing that takes place within a 72-hour window of competition and then potentially what the, that rapid response testing where you can get the results back that would take place probably Friday night or Saturday morning where you can get the results back of those tests within about 15 minutes. A PCR test is kind of the gold standard and that would that 72 hours I think gives coaches a little bit of a better window to plan if a student athlete does test positive but then you've got to you got to follow up with that a little bit closer to the game time as well. All right Hunter thank you. Tom. Um, Hey, Hunter. Thanks for doing this. Hey, Tom. Um, yeah, hey, uh, if, if the 12-game schedule falls, what, what's your personal preference for how uh, to schedule the rest that you can try to salvage? Uh, eight and one, eight and two. Um, what, what are your thoughts on spring also personally? Well, Tom, I personally think if we go to an SEC-only schedule, I think it would be great for Georgia, Florida, Alabama, LSU to all play a home-and-home -home series. Uh, to accommodate the majority of their schedules, and the rest of us will figure it out from there. I say that tongue-in-cheek somewhat, but um, 
you know, I don't know that Coach Pittman relishes the idea of a SEC only schedules, but it does provide you some more flexibility as far as scheduling games. If it's an eight, nine, or 10 game SEC schedule uh, where you can uh, change some games if you have some testing um, issues with one team or another that you may maybe not have. So, um, you know, all the options are on the table. I, I just want to play football this year, Tom. And I think that our football team, our football staff, if that's eight SEC games and one non-conference game or 10 SEC games, uh, we'll play whatever we're able to play this year. Okay, and to the extent that you can, what are your conversations like with the Nevada AD? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Knuth or Newth, and, and then uh, Swarbrick at Notre Dame. Um, is there talk that if the ACC, that you could still get that game in? Sure. Uh, Doug and I spoke um, Tuesday after our SEC meetings, and uh, Doug and Nevada, they, right now as they sit, they're, they're ready to come here and play, and we're ready to have them here on September 5th and play. And, uh, Jack and I have missed each other this week. We have not been able to, to connect, but I will tell you that the, the ACC includes Notre Dame now under their umbrella, and we're trying to salvage as many of those SEC, ACC games as we can. Thanks, and clearly, um, Kyle, I'd have more if we have time to rotate back around. Thank you. I got you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Bobby? You know, more on that Notre Dame game, have you had discussions in the past? I know that they've come out and said that they aren't really looking for fans in the stands. What have the conversations been like with Notre Dame? Because I know that's a, a game a lot of people have circled on the schedule. I don't know that they have, Bobby, definitively – they have a plan in place. I think you will see across the country that everybody will have a little bit different plan based on the Department of Health guidelines in their, in their states and what they're able to accommodate within each of their venues. And so we have not received a definitive number. If, we, if we're able to play football at Notre Dame on September 12th, what that uh, visiting team accommodations would look like. I know that we have talked about uh, a, a significant reduction in those um, as, an, as the SEC. Um, so that we can get as many of our home fans into those venues and, and not as many visiting team fans. And I know that this is not something that you can necessarily put into your budget, but the lack of being able to, to make recruiting visits for coaches and recruiting visits from players, how much has that saved the university? Kind of a ball, not necessarily I need a number, but it, does that really go into the factoring about the, what you're talking about, how to make some financial constraints? Absolutely. I mean, I think across our sports, that's a seven-figure uh, reduction in our budget. Our coaches have done an incredible job recruiting recruiting virtually. Um, our RSN team has built some really nice uh, virtual recruiting videos, and I think our coaches are getting more and more comfortable uh, with that. I don't think they feel like that's ideal, but I think you'll see even in the future when this ship is righted, I think you'll see coaches kind of find a, a really nice balance between virtual recruiting and as much time as they have spent on the road uh, really being cut in half. Thank you. Guy. You mentioned the mask earlier. How do you convince Arkansas fans that wearing a mask is not a political statement? I, I think we I think we have way, and I'm not a political person at all, so I'm not going to try to make it a political statement. I think we have heard uh, from top-level medical advisors uh, that the number one, number two way to uh, decrease the spread of this virus is by wearing masks. I don't, I don't have to hear it from the governor. I don't have to hear it from... Uh, the president or our board. Um, if you have some medical advisors who should be providing us our guidance when we're talking about a pandemic, uh, they, it, when they say that that is the one thing you need to do, um, I'm going to listen to them. In regards to student athletes on campus that have tested positive, college is like the most social time of your life. Have you been pleased with how they've reacted to the procedures and just social distancing up there in Fayetteville? I have. You know, we were we, out of the gates. Um, there's an education process for sure because college students are college students. But I think as we get closer to the fall sports season, uh, you're starting to see um, the habits of our football, soccer, volleyball, cross country teams change uh, when they are away from our venues. I think they, they feel that their seasons are imminent and they don't want to do anything uh, that hurts that. The one thing I will tell you about each of the cases um, – that we've had, we've been able to trace them to either to a student athlete or a staff member traveling outside of Northwest Arkansas and bringing that virus back. There has been zero um, 
transfer of that virus within any of our athletic facilities. Hutch? Yeah, Hunter, I was just wondering if uh, if something does happen to the games like Nevada or, or Charleston Southern, ULM, do you have a, a short list of possible like replacements uh, for those games? And would Arkansas State possibly be a, a under consideration for that? But I tell you, I think if, if we lose those games, uh, that'll probably be the result of having a conference only schedule. And so I don't see Arkansas State or anybody else um, outside of the teams that are currently on our schedule from a non-conference standpoint uh, that we would compete against them. But that's as we sit here today, everything changes. But I think if we lose any of those games, you'll see that um, that'll be a conference as a result of a conference only schedule. All right. Thanks, Hunter. Matt Jones. Hunter, you were asked about the Texas A&M game in Arlington a little bit earlier. You've also got the Missouri game in Kansas City. Have, have there been discussions on the conference level uh, pertaining to those games that are, uh, you know, technically home games, but that are being played off campuses? Has there been any discussion maybe trying to uh, localize your games to the SEC campuses? Uh, there has not, um, other than uh, obviously Texas A&M's desire, having already lost a home game, not to lose another home game. Um, I think in talking to Missouri's AD, they still plan to play that game um, if it's played in, in Arrowhead Stadium. You still there? Right yeah, sorry, I, my line was muted again. Uh, Hunter, this is the first chance we've had a chance to talk to you since uh, the, the lawsuit against the Razorback Foundation was filed. Uh, in that lawsuit, Brett Bielema's attorney claimed that you quoted appeared to be the driving force behind the foundation's decision to stop making those buyout payments. Uh, I wonder what your reaction is to being named in that lawsuit. And did you have any involvement in the Razorback Foundation stopping those payments to Bielema last year? Uh, you know, Matt, th this was a, a matter uh, that was uh, really predates me. I mean, Coach Bielema was terminated before I arrived. Um, the foundation had already started to negotiate his release agreement as I was arrive, arriving and trying to onboard a, a new football coach. Um, of course, I've had conversations with Scott Verity and the Razorback Foundation, but th this is a contract that was executed uh, by the Razorback Foundation, was guaranteed by the Razorback Foundation. The buyout was negotiated by the Razorback Foundation. This is 100% a Razorback Athletic Foundation decision. Um, I support the Razorback Foundation, absolutely, but uh, for someone to accuse me of being the driving force uh, behind that um, and not, they're not really paying attention to the timing of my arrival uh, to our campus. Brandon Marcello, you got anything? Good. All right, let's get our, uh, we'll start working our way back around here. If you've got something that I didn't get to you, why don't you drop something in the chat to me and uh, we'll get to you. Bob, you got any more questions? Redundant. Question. Yeah, Hunter. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Hey, I actually had a basketball question. You know, Eric obviously made a major hire with, with, with David Patrick. I'm sure you were involved in that process. Just wondering what, 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 what you think of that hire. I think it's a great hire, Bob. Um, when uh, Coach Musselman approached me about uh, his list of candidates for – that position. Um, he said he had one special coach that was a sitting head coach that he had a previous relationship with that he thought was the best person to fill that role. And so him and I worked together to try to develop um, a contract that we thought would uh, attract Coach Patrick to leave a head coaching position that he had been very successful in uh, to come here and be, in, be our associate head coach. And I've had some time to spend with Coach Patrick uh, this week as he's gotten to campus and I've been very impressed with, with him um, and just how the, the, the chemistry that already exists between him and Eric and the rest of the staff. Yeah, and I have one follow-up with, with, you know, if A&M wants to move that game to College Station, I mean, it obviously takes two to tango. Do you have to agree to that? Does Greg Sankey uh, have the final word on that? Or what, what happens if A&M says we want it in College Station? You say, no, the contract says we play in, in Arlington. How, how does that get worked out? 
I think very similar to the, the games in Little Rock, I think that the commissioner of the Southeastern Conference is the final arbitrator on that. Okay, th thanks, thanks, Kyle. Nikki? Hi, Hunter. Um, financially, would it be more prudent to just not have a season at all or to start it and then have to have to stop the season? Like, is there – I know, T, you'd rather play if you can play. But, I mean, financially, obviously, whatever number of games that we can start um, and play um, helps us in a number of areas. The, the, the ticket sales piece, the donations piece, sponsorships, licensing – the, the television revenue with the SEC network, CBS, as well as ESPN. So um, even if it's an abbreviated schedule of eight games, uh, that's much better for us financially uh, than playing zero games. Got it. And then um, have you and the other athletic directors kind of talked about what kind of impact all this is going to have on, you know, just teams having a level playing field on game day? We have. Um, obviously, there's uh, gamesmanship that exists um, just in college sports in, in general. And, um, and that, that's why, um, not that we want to follow what the Big Ten did, because our first option, as I said, was the, a 12-game schedule. But uh, to have a conference-only ske schedule gives you some flexibility if you have a team that just cannot compete. If, they, let's say, their first-string offense is all wiped out because of how they meet. Um, that you'd have the ability to reschedule uh, that game later in the year um, if you have a conference-only schedule. It makes it easier to do that. Um, if it's a non-conference game, it's really going to probably just be a no contest, and you're not going to have the opportunity to play that game. Thank you. Kyle Deckelbaum. Hey, Hunter. You know, uh, Sam waited a long time to be a head coach, and then all this happens. I just wonder how you think he's handling – so much uncertainty. Sam Pittman has been unbelievable um, for uh, someone that has never been a head coach other than at the junior college level early in his tenure. He has handled everything that has been thrown at him and his staff uh, like he is a seasoned veteran head coach. I've been incredibly impressed. Uh, walking out yesterday, or actually it was not yesterday, it was Tuesday, uh, when we had you know, our first uh, opportunity for our coaches to truly be involved with our players on the field for about an hour on Tuesday afternoon and, and how that was organized and to see him walking around and the excitement that he was walking around. I, I hope we get to play football just for him because I know um, he's been waiting a long time for this opportunity and he has handled it like a champ. Hey, and so um, just take us through the next couple of weeks. You know, if, if you guys say that the decision has to be made by the end of the month, um, I guess take us through how those, some of those decisions will, you know, exactly be made. We meet by way of Zoom uh, two or three times a week as Southeastern Conference athletic directors. Uh, we probably read um, information on a daily basis from medical professionals that are sent to us about as we're tracking this virus. I, I like to tell people I am an AD and not an MD, but I've learned a great deal more about um, medicine than I ever had hoped to, to learn. And I think it's just for us to follow the data. And, you know, there may be, Kyle, a cinder block that just slaps us in the face that makes this decision really, really easy for, for us one way or the other. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like the, if this just kind of trends towards the middle, it really makes the decision that much harder about which way to go. You know, one of the things that I think, you know, it really goes unnoticed and unmentioned, I think it's unique, and I talk to my colleagues in our department that have uh, young kids that are playing sports, that they're youth sports happening all over our community. There's youth baseball games and youth softball games and travel basketball games. Our coaches sit in their offices on the weekends and watch basketball games from gyms across the country that have 10, 12, 15 courts going at uh, one time. And there's not been a word said about the success uh, of any of those things. And I understand the ages of most of those boys and girls that are playing those sports, but there are sports uh, that are happening all over the country. Right now, Colin. Yeah, I, I, I used to be a NASCAR fan. I've become a NASCAR fan again here in the last couple of weeks because it's really you know with live sports. I watched the Bristol race with thirty thousand fans last night. Major League Baseball is going to start up next week. The NBA, I think, will start some some preseason scrimmages next week. We'll get a lot of data uh, from what's happening in the professional venues over the next couple of weeks that I think will really help and guide us. 
Thanks, Tom. Hunter. Tom. Yep. Hey, Hunter. I, I'm I'm assuming that July might be a, a little bit of a slower month. So I'm wondering how for ADs. I'm wondering how COVID-19 has impacted your day-to-day and how many different entities and stuff you have Zoom with on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and what that's been like. Well, Tom, I will tell you, I have bought stock in Zoom since this all started (laughs) after I spent about a month solid on Zoom. Um, It is my life right now. This is probably um, my Zoom call started this morning at eight o'clock and uh, this is, I've got one more after, after this. Um, and you're right, July normally is when we're taking some time off as, as administrators, and that's just not going to happen uh, this year. There, there's too much on the line for us, and at some point in time, um, my family and I will get away, and quite honestly, where are we going to get away to right now? So um, it's, a, it's a good excuse to, to stay around and work, but uh, it's a definitively different schedule, Tom, for sure, but it's different for all of us, right? Uh, we all have different things that we're going on. You guys should all be um, in Atlanta or wherever the media, uh, SEC football media day was going to be held this year, covering that, eating high on the hog, right? <laughs> and now you're sitting in your homes listening to this AD talk about COVID and other unexciting things. We, we do like our restaurants. Hey, I had a small conversation with John Fagg and, uh, yesterday, and he talked about going to Dolphin Island and that it's hard for him to decompress. And I'm sure – you got closer to him during that football coaching search when you were together so much. I'm wondering just what insight you can provide to about, uh, you know, your colleague, John, and um, just, just um, how he operates as a human. Yeah. Um, J- John keeps everything lighthearted. He's got a great sense of humor. Um, you know, we're, we're able to, to poke at John a little bit. He keeps the, the office environment very light around here. He doesn't take, uh, I mean, he takes his job seriously. Don't get me wrong, but um, he, he brings a sense of levity that we really need, uh, especially right now, uh, around our office and on our Zoom calls. Okay, and finally, you referenced the youth sports that are going on and the, the restart in some other areas. Do you think that maybe there's been a bit of an overreaction that we that we should we need to play football and we should play football? Oh, gosh. Now you're going to – has there been an overreaction? I, I don't know. I'm not a medical professional, Tom. You know, I tried to, you know, I, I, I will listen to one far right news source and one far left news source, and then I figure the truth somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's how I kind of gather uh, my, my information. And, um, you know, w- what I know is that the majority of, uh, if not all of the student athletes and even our staff that um, contracted the virus had very few, if any, symptoms. Um, that kept them down no more than 24 hours. But I know that in other parts of the country, it has been the far opposite extreme, that the the death rate has been much higher. It's impacted people differently. But at some point in time, I I do feel like we've got to to move on with um, our new norm. And that new norm is things that involve a great deal of testing it and the social distancing and the wearing of the mask and the hand sanitization. And and we've just got to get back to – we're never going to get back to normal in the next year or two, it doesn't sound like, but we've got to develop what that new normal looks like uh, where we have to make some personal decisions, but when we make those decisions to kind of leave our house and do things, that there's some things that we just should do that are in the best interest of everyone we may come in contact with. Thank you. So I don't know if I put around that question enough or not, Tom. Hey, Hunter. It's Trey Biddy again. Hey, Trey. So, Mediocre is an interesting word. I'm going to rewind you about 30 minutes. Some people can take that to mean middle of the road. Some people think it means completely inadequate. Can you put that like more in a scale for us, like what your level of optimism is on playing fall sports? And also, is that based on the people making the decisions or what we're seeing around the country with the spread of coronavirus? I'd say mediocre is just what it sounds like. I'm 50-50 right now. I will tell you, a month ago, I was probably 70-30, and that's where I'm 50-50. Here's, I think, what, um, as athletic directors and administrators in this field, um, I think we're looking for someone that's a lot smarter than all of us to give us a great deal of direction. I mean, Commissioner Sankey has been incredible throughout, from from March to to right now, Um, but... He's not a medical professional. Um, we, and, you know, you, again, I'm going to say, like, you have one medical professional may tell you something and another 
tells you something totally different. And I think some of that has to do with the data that we just don't know um, whether you're a medical professional or not um, about enough about this virus to make really good decisions. So you just have to make the best decisions you can. And we talked about it a little bit, and, and, and I don't want to say putting people's lives in jeopardy is like playing a game of poker, but you know, sometimes you just have to make decisions with the information that you know and make the best decision possible. It's kind of like a poker game. Like you, you know what you have in your hand, but you don't know what card's getting ready to get turned over uh, when you're playing that game. And, but you just have to make the best decisions with the information that you have. And that's what we're trying to do as administrators. And we feel that we'll have better information the deeper we go into the summer before making this decision. Thanks, Tony. Bob, you want to wrap us up? Hey, Bob, did you watch a NASCAR race last night? I, I, I did not. I didn't, I didn't know it was on. I'm, I'm sorry. They had 30,000 people at their first live sporting event with fans in several months. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not a big NASCAR person. But, uh, Bob, it doesn't matter. It's a live sporting event. Well, if I'd known, I would have watched. Hey, next time there's one on, why don't you text me and make sure I'm, I'm aware. I, I think Saturday or Sunday at Texas is the next oh, one. Okay. Hey, when, when you said you bought Zoom stock, were, were you kidding or were you being serious? No, I'm serious. Can you tell us how many shares you bought? They're not very many. I, I, I'm just a day trader. I just dabble. Okay. Well, that seems like a good uh, future thing to invest in. I, I will tell you, Bob, since I bought it, it's gone up about $100 a share. Man, I, I need to get some of that, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask if you really were kidding or serious. I'm no, I'm serious. serious. I bought some. Okay. I, I, I'm good. Sounds like you missed the boat on that, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I probably don't have as much money to invest as Hunter does. <laughs> hey, Bob, I don't think it's going down, by the way. Okay. Yeah, I think, I, I, think, <laughs> I, I, think uh, I think you're right. I missed the boat on that one. All right. That is uh, – we got – one more question from Ty, and I'll wrap us up. Go ahead, Ty. Go ahead, Ty. We've had some student athletes speak out about social issues. Have you had any student athletes, whether football, come to you either privately or publicly talking about how they really want to play this season? Well, you know, I have the, the luxury of having a son um, that plays football and a son that's a graduate uh, assistant on the football staff. Mm -hmm. And I tell you that the, the football players want to play football. Um, they are, they're working on – here's the thing that they, they have told me um, unequivocally, don't put us through fall camp and then pull the plug on us. <laughs> they said fall camp is the worst three or four weeks uh, of football season. They said please don't put us through fall camp and then pull the plug on us. Make a decision before uh, fall camp. And so they, they want to play. They, they're here working hard. Our soccer team's here working I mean, we have 300-plus student athletes. We have more baseball baseball and softball players here right now than we've ever had during the summer. Uh, th these young men and women, they, they want to play their sport. They, they miss it desperately. They're making a great deal of sacrifices right now in their own personal and social lives that they normally have during the summer um, so they can be here and train and, and get better. They, they just want to play. And I'm going to try, I'm going to try to find a way to, to make sure that happens. And, and I hate the narrative that we're doing this just for the money at this level. It's not about the, the money. Um, it's a passion for these young men and women. And, and yes, there's significant financial um, benefits, if you want to say that, that come from this. But the majority of those financial benefits go back into the lives and the experience of those student athletes from their scholarship. You know, it's $11 million, their scholarship bill. We've spent $4 million of food on them. We have mental health, a full time mental health division with three full-time mental health people. We have athletic trainers. We have strength and conditioning coaches. We have some of the best head coaches and assistant coaches across this country that are helping them train and get better at their sport. We have an academic staff that helped them achieve a 3.43 cumulative GPA this past spring semester. Um, we, we invest a significant amount of the resources we generate back into the lives and the experiences of our student athletes. And, and that's the financial piece of it.